Good evening. Um, so, just to start this off, can I ask how many people of our audience are actually wearing some sort of fitness tracker at the moment? Fitness tracker, something like that. I've got a Garmin. Jenny, you've got a Fitbit. Okay. Okay, so quite a few people are wearing, I, I'm looking at the audience, I'd say around about 35% of our audience currently uh, using some sort of fitness tracker. And presumably that's because you're trying to adhere to the government and the health uh, recommendations of doing 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. Is that correct? Okay, so... Um, Right at the end of this 30-minute start, um, we're going to hear something about, well, what's the recommendations for the sort of exercise that we should be doing? Um, Barbara mentioned that it's about the pros and cons of exercise. I'm going to be slightly controversial here, and I'm going to talk about maybe not all exercise is good for us. And one of the reasons for that is that um, we're coming up to 12 months uh, ago um, when I completed a charity bike ride for the university uh, and we decided that we were going to do the North Coast 500. Um, so that starts off from Inverness and it goes right around the north coast of Scotland and arrives back in Inverness and we were planning on doing this over eight days, averaging somewhere in the region about 65 miles a day. So we started off on the Saturday and everything went well. Um, I did 65 miles, no problem. Got up on the Sunday, and we went over the Black Nabar, which, according to the cycling magazines, is one of the hardest uh, climbs to do in the entire UK. So um, there was about 25 of us, intrepid adventurers, set off on this bike ride. I, it took me about um, maybe an hour to get to the top of the Black Nabar, got to the top and the weather was awful um, and I made the mistake of waiting for some people to catch us up. So I huddled down behind uh, some rocks and I got really cold and then going on to the descent to Apple Cross, I got even colder, stopped off in a cafe, had a cup of coffee, had a cake, had another cup of coffee, which as somebody who did a PhD in nutrition and exercise, that was probably really bad advice. And if I saw somebody doing that, I'd probably give them a really ticking off. So about an hour and a half after we'd set off from the cafe, I suddenly started feeling really ill. And I stopped the bike and I got off and I felt my pulse and I had an irregular pulse. I was having what are called ectopic beats, so an additional contraction from your ventricles, quite regular. So as an exercise physiologist, what I thought I'd do is, if I get back on the bike, I'll go back into sinus rhythm and I'll be okay. So I hopped back on the bike and 20 minutes later, I felt worse than I had before. So then got off the bike again and asked one of the clinicians that we were with to take my pulse. Because I thought, am I really having these ectopics? And as soon as the person checked my pulse, the next thing they said was, can you lie down? Has somebody got a space blanket? Can we phone for the van to come and collect Derek? And I realized that something was quite serious. So I got took off this bike ride. I came back to Aberdeen that night. The next morning, I walked up here to the IMS. And my boss said to me, can you go into A&E? So just for a checkup, so I went in, I had an ECG. There was a bit of an abnormality with the ECG and they took a blood sample and there was a biomarker that was elevated, which suggested that, ooh, we're not entirely sure if you've had a heart attack. So I then had the next three days in cardiology where I had a whole series of tests only to find that there was nothing wrong. But I did have this irregular heartbeat for about three days I was discharged from hospital. I've had a few more tests. We think it's a one-off. And I thought, well, you know, these things happen. Having done some research in the past about the effect of long duration exercise on cardiac function, what I knew was that um, 
if you do exercise for around about between five and 10 hours, in some people, you can get a suppression in cardiac function. And they call it cardiac stunning. And one of these biomarkers becomes elevated. So I thought, maybe that's what happened to me. I've been a regular exerciser for over 40 years now, either doing track and field or doing cycling. So I had a look again at some of the literature. And what it suggests is that for veteran athletes that regularly do things like ultra marathons, extra long bike rides, some of the changes that they see in cardiac function actually a little bit uh, pathological. So there's a, currently there's some research that's going on to look at why is it that people that have a lifetime of exercise, and it's on the extreme now, that actually what you see is a detriment in cardiac performance. So maybe not all exercise is good for us. What we know is that some exercise is better than no exercise, but exercising maybe for prolonged periods of time might actually be detrimental. So what I want you to do for the next 20 minutes is listen to my other speakers, but also if you've got some questions, is at the Q&A stage is just to put those questions to one side and then we can discuss what I've talked about in that Q&A section. Thank you. All right, thank you, Derek. So, my say, my name's Jenny Gregory, and I work here at the university as a lecturer. And what I'm going to talk to you is about your bones. And it's the same kind of question. Can you, can you wear your bones out, essentially? And I'm particularly going to be looking at osteoporosis. I'm not really planning to talk about osteoarthritis, because in just over a month, on 22nd of May, if you look at your literature, um, we have Alessio Bricker, who is doing some wonderful work in exercising osteoarthritis. So I'd recommend you definitely go and hear what he's got to say, because he's doing some really nice work. So yeah, can you, can you wear your bones out? What do your bones do? It's like, well, and, you know, should we sit around and do nothing? Would that, is that the best thing? Well, no. Bones are very much like muscles. They do need... The more we do, the more we use them, the bigger and the stronger they grow. And the way this works is we have cells in our bones and they sense everything we do. These little cells called osteocytes. Right through our life, right from when we're born to when we die, they continue to sense what they do and they direct where we need bone. So we have new bone where we need it and we also remove bone where we don't need it. One of the places you see this most is in racket sports. So if you look at elite athletes um, in things like tennis or squash, now most of us have a dominant arm. So I'm, I'm right-handed, I don't know about you, left-handed, right-handed. We've probably got maybe a two to three percent difference between our dominant and our non-dominant arm. But if you look at people who like say elite athletes for tennis or squash and other racket sports, it's more like 10 or even 15 percent or even more in some people because their serving arm just gets so much more exercise, so much more loading that it's actually quite a lot bigger. Also, archaeologists, the way our bones adapt all the way through our lives is also useful by archaeologists. So an archaeologist can turn up and looking at a whole pile of skeletons can work out, well, who were the archers and who was riding horses, really just depending on the shape and the features of their bones. And the good news is, for the best for our bones, we don't actually need to be kind of at Wimbledon. We don't need to be sort of there to competing at that elite level. Our walking, carrying our own body weight around is enough to build our bones. And if you're actually regular walkers, you're looking at about probably, um, studies say, maybe a sort of 30% decrease in the risk of hip fracture. So if you're getting your 10,000 steps or even more a day and you're staying active weight-bearing, you're definitely doing the right thing for your bones. We see these changes right from when you're tiny. So one of the studies we've looked at, we've actually, it's a study that's been going for over 70 years. People have been followed right from when they were born, all born the same week in March, and they've stood around the whole life. So we know when they started walking, and we can actually see those differences in their 60s, in the mid-60s, when you look at their bones, you can see that those who started walking earlier, it's not much, 
but there are slightly larger, slightly stronger bones with a slightly different shape that you can actually see right the way throughout their life. And that's how responsive our bones are to walking and all the physical activity we do. So that's good, but what happens when we stop? Well, if we stop getting those signals, and that could be because we'd stop doing anything, or maybe you're an astronaut like Tim Peake and you're going to spend six months in the space station. Now, Tim Peake actually lost about six to seven percent of his bone density whilst he was up in space because without the gravity, those osteocytes aren't getting the cells, aren't getting the signals to build the bone. And that would take several years actually down here on Earth. But you see similar things. You can do, um, people study bed rest. So to do research, for example, to help us get to Mars or to help astronauts' health, people actually do volunteer for studies where they lie, completely lie down for three months at a time. And I mean, they're monitored by, you don't get up for anything, nothing at all. You're monitored by video, you have pressure sensors in your mattress, and you see the same kind of changes down here on Earth, but you're not doing anything, and you see that bone loss. The same with things like spinal cord injuries as well. So yeah, you definitely need to exercise, and the more exercise you do, it's a lifelong thing. You, probably the most response is when you're very small. That's when you get the biggest response. You get a kind of a peak mass when you sort of, that sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, and you do tend to lose bone as you're older, but it's certainly never too late to start. There's a great study, one I absolutely love, and it was taking, uh, it was a whole load of men, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and it asked them to hop. To pick a leg and hop for 10 minutes a day for a year. And we're talking about, so people, 60s, 70s, 80s, people, you may think, oh, you're losing bone, we're losing bone at that age. But no, with the hopping, they could show that the leg they were hopping on, that was gaining bone. So sort of 2 to 3% overall, up to 7% in some places. And the other bone did help a little bit, gained a little bit, but not as much, but the other leg. But by using one leg, it means that they were the same genetics, they ate the same, you know, the two legs aren't, they were both on the same people, so it makes a great control, a great control study. So that's kind of me, how you ward off your process. But a bit like Derek, the question is, can we do too much? Well, yeah, you definitely can do too much for your bones. One of the things, obviously, is injury. Injury can be a big problem, particularly if you're feeling a bit inspired after the day, and you think, I'm going to go do running, I'm going to take up a run. I'm going to go, I'm going to get a dog. I'm going to go dog walking. Now, dog walking is great in many things. People who walk dogs tend to, and the other pets, get more activity, have you know, a few visits to the doctor. But there is a higher risk of injury. So about 1%, I think, from the literature, of falls that come into accident or emergency are often things like um, tripping over your dog or being pulled over by your dog, which isn't to sort of do dogs, but it's to say... When you take up exercise, think about your injury risk, not just, um, not just the benefits, but keep an eye on what you're doing. And for example, starting running, it's quite common, so more common if you're just starting. Novice runners are more likely to have um, injuries and so on than all the more experienced runners. So take it gently and build it up slowly. But we also see elite athletes. Again, people who've spent their lifetime doing this. Real endurance runners actually in elite endurance athletes, you can have osteoporosis. People who look really healthy. Some sports have up to about 13%, 10, 13% of people who are actually competing who then actually have osteoporosis or even more with osteopenia, which is a little bit less than that. And so you do get risks of stress fractures and things, so you can certainly do too much for your bones. So the last thing I'd like to say, if you are thinking, well, if you do have osteoporosis or somebody you care about does or is at risk of fracture, what I'd recommend is there's a, a physical scheme. It's called Strong, Steady and Straight. So we, what used to be the National Osteoporosis Society is now Royal Osteoporosis Society, and they have this strong, steady, straight thing. So the idea is if you're quite weak on balance, get your balance sorted first. Get steady. Get steady. Work on your posture. Work on your gait. Work on your muscle. If you have a lot of back pain or vertebral fractures, get straight first, work on again your posture and get yourself in a good position to exercise. And once you've got those, then get strong. 
physically strong and also build your bones. So if you're really interested in that, I'd definitely recommend looking at the uh, Royal Osteoporosis Society. With that, I'd like to hand over to Arthur, I believe he's next. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Arthur Strachan. Um, I've just recently retired from the Department of Clinical Biochemistry at Forrester Hill here. But I was also involved in the Human Physiology Department of the University of Aberdeen where I did my PhD. And we were looking at something that was called central fatigue. So what I'm going to do in seven minutes is basically just throw th some things about you, about the brain and whether you think exercise is good for the brain and you know, whether it's adaptive and whatever. So, uh, central fatigue hy hypothesis was postulated by a guy called Eric Newsom from Cambridge. He basically said that during prolonged exercise, there was some peripheral changes that affected serotonin in the brain. Basically, the precursor for serotonin is an, an amino acid called tryptophan, and it can be converted into serotonin and serotonin-mediated fatigue. In general terms, the... the PhD was largely negative. And so the first question I'd kind of like to throw at you is, you know, do you think that uh, exercise is adaptive, makes changes to the brain, and uh, prevents catastrophic injury? And that is what, kind of what uh, somebody called Tim Noakes from South Africa suggested, that you have a central governance and that your brain controls the amount of exercise that you can do and prevents you from catastrophic uh, injury. Controversial, very difficult to prove. Um, another thing I'd like to throw at you, any exercise where you have to wear protective uh, gear is bad for you, especially your brain. Uh, any exercise that you perform where you don't wear a crash helmet or protective headgear is really bad for you. And what's interesting at the moment is, that, is the understanding sort of biochemistry about head injury and what happens. We all know that the brain's about a kilo and a half in weight. It's supported in a, in, within your skull and it doesn't have any sort of major structure. It's essentially just a lump of jelly and it's supported by something called cerebral spinal fluid. Okay? And in traumatic injury, you have concussions, okay? And these concussions cause small amounts of bleeding in the brain, okay? There's loss of cognitive function, loss of consciousness in some instances, and, you know, people can recover from that. Uh, in the 1920s, it was called, uh, in boxing, it was pugilistic dem dementia. And now what we're seeing in, in athletes, and there's been lots of publicity in terms of uh, North American, American football and things. The number of uh, professional fo uh, American football players, rugby players, boxers, who are get, uh, we're seeing dementia f forming at a relative early age. Okay? Now, the underlying biochemistry is uh, slowly emerging, and you may have all heard of amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease, and also tau, tau tangles. And in, in America, uh, concussive injury, you tend to see a bleed into the brain and that changes essentially the sort of protected um, normal biochemistry. And what you see in, within the cells is you have structures called uh, myelin, not myelin, um, Microtubules. Microtubules within a cell um, are important for the transport of uh, various chemicals and things. And essentially, they're a, a long protein coil and they are held together by uh, something called tau. And when, when, when you have a bleed into the brain, changes certain biochemical parameters, and there are changes that happen that allow the tau, tau to untangle the, the microtubule and the sort of biochemistry of the brain is changed. They accumulate and, and tangle together. And these on histology, you, you can 
you can look at them under the microscope and see that they're present. And over a period of time, these begin to cause dementia. Alzheimer's is slightly different, uh, but the, the, the underlying biochemistry has some similarities. So exercise that involves concu a head trauma, concussion, is generally bad for you. Um, show of, quick show of hands. Who thinks that exercise is beneficial to their mental health? Okay. Is that because when you finish exercise, you're glad that it's over and generally feel better? Okay. That's one possibility. Now, the, under, the, the literature surrounding uh, whether brain supports your mental health is, is divided, actually. You know, majority of people perceive that it's good for you, but in the, the sort of medical literature is less convincing. I would ask, you know, there's a 30% chance uh, that uh, exercise is preventative of uh, developing uh, depressive in, uh, de depression. Now, the reasons for that is largely unknown, okay? Um, when you exercise, certain uh, neurochemicals within your brain gets increased and you know, there is a certain feel-good factor. Immediately after, after exercise, your cognitive ability is enhanced, your ability to learn things is advanced, okay? How much exercise you have to do to achieve those sorts of things. Uh, generally, you know, national guidelines are 150 minutes uh, over the week. Uh, a really modest, modest to high intensity exercise. How much exercise to modify your brain uh, function probably requires a, a little bit more than that, but it is. Exercise in general uh, increases something called uh, brain neurotropic fac growth factor, which helps you build uh, new neurons within your hippocampus, which is involved in cognition and learning, and also promotes growth of uh, neurons in your frontal uh, cortex. Again, executive function, cognition as well. So, you know, in exercise is beneficial. There is, however, a tipping point, and athletes talk about overtraining, overreaching, and there appears to be a point, especially during prolonged exercise, where it becomes detrimental to the general biochemistry and your, your, your well-being. Okay. Um, Derek didn't really touch on, on, on uh, the, he was going to do the sort of metabolic and cardiovascular things. We've all heard of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, increase in, in obesity. And clearly, we, the majority of people would say that exercise is beneficial to, to, to preventing these disorders. However, it's probably a whole host of other factors that are equally involved, like stress and changes to your, your biochemistry that results in cha and, and, and diet, etc. that are important in, in diabetes, as well as you know, doing a little bit of exercise to, to modify your weight and things. Uh, I think that's all I've got to say. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll wait and see what comes back uh, with your questions. Thank you. Okay, I feel like I'm gonna be a little bit of a disappointment, I have to say. <laughs> I'm Louise McCulloch, I'm one of the orthopaedic consultants uh, that works across the road and um, works up at Wood End. I do a lot of exercise, so government guidelines suggest that you should do 150 minutes a week. I probably do that every day. Um, but not everybody has to do that. All of the things that I do every day are because I want to do them, because I want to get better at what I do. I couldn't live without exercise. I couldn't work. 
I wouldn't be the same person. I couldn't. Exercise to me is my stress relief. It's how I deal with my horrendous week on, weekend on call that I've just had where I was up operating until 2 o'clock this morning, back in at 6 o'clock this morning, and I will leave here and I will go to the gym because I've not been to the gym for a couple of days and I'm like, I need to go and do something. It's how I feel better about myself, how I go and clear my head, go for a run. I'm not very academic. <laughs> I can't tell you lots of papers. I can tell you all the NHS guidelines and personally, I think that exercise massively improves my self-esteem. It improves my mental health. It allows me to go out and meet people that I wouldn't normally have met. I've started teaching an exercise class and every Sunday and every Wednesday morning at 6.30, I have this same group of people. It's a bunch, maybe five or six women, who every time, maybe spend the first five minutes of class having a wee bitch and a wee moan, and talking about their life stresses and their life hassles. And then, by the end of that hour, they just feel better about themselves. They feel that they've achieved something. And I don't think that there's any way that you can replicate that. Exercise to me is, would, if you can prescribe that, you're prescribing people with this amazing pill that will just make a lot of things better. And not everybody has to exercise to the same level that I exercise, but that's because that's what I want to do. If, if you can take an extra set of stairs, that's exercise, yeah? If on your Fitbit, you can get to your 10,000 steps every day, then that's all you need to get. If you can increase your exercise to 150 minutes every week, and that's, that can be anything. That can be going for a power walk, or it can be going down to Bridge Street steps and running up and down them 15 times, which I do twice a week. Everybody has different bits of exercise that they can do. Some people will go and join a team sport. Some people play rugby for the team feeling. Being part of that team is really important to them. And fair enough, yeah, there's a risk of concussion. But do you want to know? You could fall off your bike and risk concussion. There's risks everywhere and you have to weigh up the risks and benefits and what you're willing to accept. I do a lot of pre-hospital medicine. I do a lot of um, sports medicine. I cover Aberdeen Grammar Rugby. I see a lot of head injuries. I cover SRU Rugby. I see a lot of soft tissue knee injuries. And for these people who exercise a lot, it's really important that you can create an exercise plan for them to allow them to get back so that they feel that they're not losing out. So, for example, if you've got a knee injury, I am never going to tell a person that they shouldn't be in a gym. You've injured your knee. There's nothing wrong with your, your abs and there's nothing wrong with your arms. Fair enough, you might not be able to go for your run. You might not be able to do your bridge street steps. But there's always something that you can do that will make you feel better about yourself. As well as my own personal mental health and the reasons that I do exercise, there's evidence to say that it decreases your risk of colon cancer by 50%. And all of these other things like breast cancer by 20%, depression, anxiety, stress, diabetes. I, think, I personally think that everybody over the age of 40 should be doing a resistance, um, a resistance program. You should be getting up, carrying yourself. You don't need to go to the gym. You can go and do 10 press-ups. Go and just do a little bit of exercise individually in your own house. Also, I personally feel that everybody should be doing, at every age, should be doing a little bit of high intensity interval training. Just to raise your heart, your heart rate. And those 150 minutes, that are the government guidelines, that's not just a gentle stroll while you're tripping over your dog. That's like a proper power walk, getting your heart rate up. And that's what constitutes moderate exercise. 
And if you can increase to that, that to high intensity exercise for those 150 minutes, that's said to have better benefits for you.